This is AV Week, episode 0000, Friday, July 29th, 2011. Ready. AV, AV Week. Performing scan. AV Week. Online. This is AV Week. And with us today is Linda Sid Frembies from the AV Writer. Hello, Linda. Hello. And George Tucker. George Tucker is known as Tucker Tuesday or Tucker Tuesday. Hello, George. Hello, all. Uh, Linda is an, an AV writer. She's also um, does some um, freelance. She's a freelance writer for the AV industry. Uh, George is a live staging engineer. He's also a tech blogger. Uh, with me in studio is Michael Drainer from Tech Electronics in St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, everyone. Uh, Michael is an integrator uh, for the avian industry. He's been in, involved for quite a number of years. And my name is Tim Albright. I'm the host, moderator, and uh, and kind of the yay who, who put this kind of thing together. So uh, first up, since we're I, I, it kind of feels close enough to do a, a roundup or a recap of Infocom. It was only uh, about a month or so ago, June 15th through the 17th uh, in Orlando. I'm going to go around and see kind of what the one, number one or number two things that knocked your socks off in Orlando. Uh, Linda, we'll start with you. What was something that just wowed you at Infocom this year? Well, I should actually, I'll put a caveat on my uh, selection, only because if, if anyone was actually at the show, you'll know that it would take more than those three days to see everything at the show. So I don't want anyone to feel slighted, uh, but... My favorite thing was the InFocus Mondo Pad. That I thought, uh, it sort of combines all the things I think our industry has been going towards with interactivity, collaboration, conferencing, um, and it was just really an impressive piece of technology. Now, for somebody who didn't see it, because I actually missed that one, what what is the InFocus Mondo Pad? Well, um, you you can probably go to the InFocus site, and that'll explain it better than I can. (laughs) But <laughs> but just think of, of a 55-inch LCD, full 1080p tablet Ooh, that wow. can be used for conferencing. So, I mean, again, it's just one of those – to me, it just sort of tied together all the things that from my perspective, from someone who writes about this industry, it's all the things that we've been talking about, right? So we've been talking about uh, unified communication, collaboration, interactivity – um, touch panels. I mean, it's it's all of these things combined into a 55-inch LCD. That is sexy. A 55-inch touch panel. I like that. Um, George, what is your, your one or two things that, that kind of blew you away? I went more, a little more practical. Um, I was really impressed <laughs> by the, uh, the AMX, um, the panoramic panels that they were putting out. Uh, I'm unsure if these are, are new or not, but I've never seen them before, and they really wowed me the way they move and the way they feel. Um, when it's done as like a tabletop, it really reminded me of the old uh, was it the uh, was it Bang and Olsen Bio Sound CD players? Oh wow, remember yeah. those mm-hmm. very elegant looking yet practical yet something unique enough that you just want to touch. And I like just how it had that practicality from everything from conference rooms to a home use. It just really flowed very nicely with all the way that you could swipe stuff and just how it laid out. So this is the the, um, the edgeless touch panel. Yeah, yeah, they call what they call the Madero X's, I believe. They're mm-hmm. like 19 something inches. Um they're kind of ungainly looking, but I really do like them. I just the minute I saw it, I wanted to touch it. It just, you know, and having been around touch panels for more than more than I care to uh, admit, <laughs> it just really wowed me and I was like, it wasn't an iPad moment, but it really was a wow. I want. I'd love to be able to find a way to put that in somewhere. And you know, that's some, there's something to be said for that because companies like Extra and Crestron and AMX and, and Aurora sometimes they have uh, a, a difficulty, uh, a difficult time coming out with a, another wow touch panel because so so often is the time uh, for a few for a few for the past few years it's been eh, it's a touch panel. You know, it, it does what it does. It, it's it's almost like a, a utility truck, you know, uh, and right. to, to hear, to see something like that, you're right. Something that's sexy and something that it, it just kind of grabs your attention and makes you want to touch it for right. the end user is huge. Yeah, I mean, that's what iPad did, really, too. I mean, it was like, hey, it's wireless, it's thin. Wow, that looks so cool. 
Um, and I think this has a similar effect for those installs where a dedicated proprietary panel is really necessary. And there are those cases, you know, where you don't want something that you're not sure if it'll last the the use and abuse that a uh, a public causeway would have or something. Yeah. Um, the other one that I really liked, which is um, not quite on the install side, since I'm on the staging and live events side nowadays, uh, is a company called Dataton. Uh, Dataton is a Swedish company that started off doing show control, which was uh, back in the old slide days when you did multimedia, when that meant you know sound in slides. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have actually morphed into a masking soft image, image mapping company with a product called Watch Out. And it uses, uh, in the old days, it used multiple computers to do each segment of the screen so if you're familiar with this process in the old days you used to use the shutters on your projectors with certain material feeding it to make the edge blends you can only do it on a flat screen well, nowadays you can do it on curved screens and all these shaped screens and multiple locations uh, and what Dataton has done is stepped it up and they now allow um, one computer to do multiple screens and mm -hmm. they allow a stereoscopic almost 3d imagery it requires glasses but it actually looks pretty cool Oh, wow. And the really cool part is they do now something called enhanced live interaction. Right, it's a marketing name. But yeah. <laughs> what, how they showed it was they took an iPad, controlling this watch out computer, but then took an iPad, took a picture of the crowd, and it showed up on screen within about 40, uh, 15 seconds. Wow. And it was a little, and the 15 seconds was because it was so dense at Infocom with RF. Uh, if you have any of those little RF readers, which I, I carry around, it was just dense, packed. So they say typically it would take you know a couple of seconds, and they used it like a Polaroid. Polaroid would come out of this camera, take time to develop, and there was your image. That is, uh, but it's a really nifty. They, they actually use this technology on, on the um, on the uh, U two three hundred and sixty tour. Yes, that's right. They do where yes. they're taking pictures of the audience while while it's happening, and then throwing up on the screens. Yeah, yeah, and this is one of those things that does that, and it does it live interaction for like uh, audience reaction and polls. Oh, wow. So you can have audience members, you know, whatever, hitting a button or an audience feedback thing, and it'll show instantly up on the screen with like meters or some kind of graphic representation of those numbers so instant feedback from the from the audience yeah. themselves wow there's yeah. a lot of there's really a lot of use product. for that yeah and there's a few companies out there that do similar things like pandora and hypnotizer and all those guys but this really sort of steps it up with the interactivity hmm. all right mr integrator michael what was your one or two things you know, coming from the integration side of things, um, you know, we do a lot in the video conferencing world, and I was thoroughly impressed with Polycom's new Eagle Eye Director system. Had the dual high definition cameras with the ribbon microphone, full facial recognition, and what I found amazing by this is it really increases the simplicity of deploying multi camera video conferencing in a collaborative environment. So did anybody, any of you guys get a chance to see that, the Polycom stuff? No. No? No, I didn't get a chance. So, so imagine a technical director inside the codec, and that's really what it is. So uh, camera number one will pick the person that's talking. And, you know, in traditional video conferencing environments, um, when the next person starts talking, the camera would shift. It would make you dizzy, all that kind of stuff. Um, but now the second camera will pick the next talker. Then it will do a cut to the, the person that's speaking at that moment in time. So it really creates a continuous collaborative type um, flow in the video presentation. Now, is that done with, with microphone recognition, or how is that? What's interesting about it is the microphone, you know, in traditional deployments, you'd have a microphone in front of each speaker mm -hmm. at the conference table. And so you'd have a digital signal processor or something that would determine who's talking, and you'd have a preset that tells the camera where to go. But with this technology, the microphone is at the camera's location, and it picks up the direction of that voice, and then the software in the codec recognizes who's talking with its facial recognition software, locks onto that individual, and then makes the cut. Hmm. Interesting. All right, uh, I guess it's my turn. My, my number one, and this is only because of sending HD down a single pipe, down a single piece of, of, of Cat5 or, or Twisted Pair, really, not Cat5. Uh, and that is is Crestron's DM MPS. Um, it's not because it's that box. It's just because that's like one of the first boxes that has everything in built into it from a control system, and from a uh, an HD distribution system. Um, everybody knows the issues that that the industry has with HDCP and with sending high definition content over longer distances. I mean, anything over a hundred feet or so, then then you're going to start getting into some issues. 
And the MPS is just their digital media MPS, which if you're not familiar with their MPS series, it is a video mixer, it's an audio mixer, it's a control processor, all kind of mixed into one box. And then you've got, um, you throw the DM stuff on top of that, which DM is, is Crestron's version of HD over over a single uh, piece of, of twisted pair. Extron has it, AMX has it, a, a bunch of people have it. This just happens to be theirs. And I think it's cool because it's it's one that... Yeah, that's actually coming out in the next six months. Uh, nothing against anybody else, but but and this is something Linda and I have talked about before. I'm a big fan of if you're if you're going to show something at a trade show, you kind of want, might want to have it out at least shipping in the in the next at least by the time the next trade show comes out. <laughs> uh, that's just me. Um, that's just me. Yes, always I, helpful. Um, I hear you feel very strongly about that. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. And you know what? It's it's me as an end user. I mean, that that really is. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I design and yeah, I program. But but when when it comes down to it, I, I'm kind of an end user. And so when I see something, I mean, I'm I'm a guy and I like electronics. If I see something and it works, I want it and I want it now. I don't want it in a year or two years, or, or I don't want, I don't want you to show me this exact same box next year at Infocom in Vegas. Well, and you're not alone in that in that world as the end user because from the integration standpoint, it becomes an absolute nightmare. And I have multiple conversations with my manufacturers and my rep firms about just this convers- about this topic particular. Don't tell me you've got this latest and greatest technology, and then not deliver it for six months, eight months, ten months. You better deliver on what you say you're going to deliver because I've have to design my systems around that. How many times, Tim, do we get together on a project and? We have uh, we, we build this design based on a technology that's supposed to be released and it's supposed <laughs> to be shipping, and then we end up having to revamp the entire design mm-hmm. by the time deployment comes around. It's yeah. an absolute nightmare. It is, and it's unfortunate for the end users who go, you know, this is this is something really cool, and especially um, I, I understand designing twelve months out, um, but you we're, we're we're working in an industry now that, especially with digital and, and how fast things move that 12 months is a lifetime. I mean, how, mm-hmm. how much stuff, guys, in the last 12 months has changed when it comes to digital and HDCP and, and, and everything? Yeah. So if, if, you're, if you're a designer, you know, or even an integrator who's a, who, does, who does design build, um, designing 12 months out almost is, is suicide. I think. But it's I think, just, too, it's, not, it's more of a, for me, it's, I, I see it more of as a marketing thing because if you announce something that the market doesn't have, you are technically first to market. So it really, it's not that it doesn't matter, but in, in that very moment, it doesn't matter. The end users, they're not thinking of the end users because for me, it's, you know, in from my perspective, it's a marketing thing. But are you first to market? I, I, and I understand the marketing part, but are you first to market then if you're not shipping it? Oh, those are just tiny little details. <laughs> Out. Shush, shush. <laughs> oh, geez. I give up. All right. Hey, so I have a I have a question for the group actually that's based on some of the description you had about the HTCP stuff. Yes. I, I know there's a lot of boxes out there now saying you don't need that. You don't need the HTCP. And from what I've been reading, and granted it's on the internet, so we'll take it for what it's worth. It's all true. There exactly. <laughs> um there are a number of products out there saying, you don't need to worry about that, we just bypass it. And, you know, if you read the HDMI.org, you know, licensing rules, they say you must have this and you must be aware of it and recognize it and acknowledge it. But there's a lot of products out there, even major manufacturers, who aren't. And I really get the feeling that HDMI is sort of going, you know, a little wrist slap, going, don't, don't do that, okay, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> and, and, and they're coming out with it. So there's these companies that invested all this money in making it right, following the rules and the sort of getting run around no they are and i don't know if this is a real issue or if everyone just sort of says okay we'll take both and we know where to put them but there is an investment issue here based on the licensing agreement and its ability to be enforced well it, th- this is actually something that I've, I've spent a lot of time on um because i have a very good friend who works for a company who has spent a lot of time doing it right and he and I have gone back and forth because when he first told me about this, I said I didn't believe him. Uh, and I didn't for a long time. I disagreed with him. I didn't think that the industry would, would stand for it. I didn't think the end user would stand for it. And so I actually sat down and I read not only the HDMI spec, but the HDCP spec and the AACSLA spec. And 
that was interesting reading. If you if you have trouble going to sleep at night, I suggest you curl <laughs> up with it. But the bottom line is this: yes, you need to worry about it. Um, there are some rumblings and there are some wink, wink, nudge, nudges that they're going to come out with an HDCP Pro or an H, uh, a specification, which gives manufacturers the ability to pay a fee and then manage actively manage the keys themselves. So let's say you have a Blu-ray player and it has a key. It goes to box A. And box A is a switcher. So box A is HDCP, HDCP Pro. It is actively managing. So it's the one talking back to the, to the Blu-ray player every two seconds saying, yes, I'm, I'm approved, I'm good. And then box A talks to the, to the display. And whether it's one display or 15 displays, that's, between, that, that's, the manu- that's box A manufacturer's problem. And then it's his it's his responsibility to then talk to the displays and make sure that they are HDCP compatible. So yes, you need to worry about it, at least as far as as the HDCP guys and the AACSLA guys are concerned. You still need to worry about it. So. Then, then then how are they allowing these these key manufacturers? And and you and I have seen a number of products like this that just like George is saying, they just totally strip it, bypass it, convert it to analog, whatever the case may be. We've all seen those products. If they're not going to enforce it, what's going to come of HDCP? And I think that, uh, that you know what, there's a key statement you just made, though. It's key manufacturers. This is not just one-offs or a hack box that somebody broke the DVD code. It's These are some big players doing this. Exactly. Yeah, and, that, and I guess that's... that's my thing is this is is there was a post on some forum somewhere and, and I, I apologize because um, I don't have the attribution, but it was a gorgeous analogy. The guy said he was an AV industry um, uh, member and he said when my dad was in uh, during the eighties, he had to go back to school to learn how to um, build or, or deal with um, fuel injection. He had built carburetors and worked on cars his entire life. But then they came out with something called fuel injection, and, and building carburetors really wasn't part of the deal anymore. He had to learn something new. And, and I think that's a good good analogy for do, going to digital and dealing with this content protection. The, the guys that are behind the content protection have a vested interest. I mean, these are the same yahoos that are, that are going out there that are, that are going to different um, countries and, and trying to get massive fines laid on people who are, who are committing piracy. So they are really, really bent on protecting their content. And I get that. These guys should be paid. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that piracy is a great thing. So, what, what, so they're going to go after this in one way, shape, or form. And if we find ways around it, guess what? They're going to hire really smart people to find better ways to lock this down. And then we're going to be stuck with a single source and a single display system, which every AV in, um, in, uh, industry person is cringing at that thought. Because, I mean, think about some of the greatest displays and some of the greatest AV um, uh, installs you've ever seen. They are not ones and ones. They are these giant manufactured multi-screen display systems but who drives that market you know that market's not driven by the av industry the, Which the, market? the, the content protection hmm? the people that that are driving this initiative it's the consumer industry that they're locking down they're not concerned about the av manufacturers and the av professionals in the industry they're concerned about the consumers that are copying content that are doing it illegally that are stealing the intellectual property so you know that that particular segment of the electronics industry is much larger than what we're dealing with in the professional AV world. It, so our voice is not as loud. No, it, it, and, but, and it but makes it, it difficult. But it affects us directly. It does. I mean, they they, they are concerned, and, and, and again, rightfully so, uh, with people copying their, mm-hmm. their, their material. And so, yes, the consumer electronics industry is, is who they're focused on. Well, primarily, what is a consumer electronic div- uh, system? It is one Blu-ray player mm-hmm. and one TV. Mm-hmm. So that's all they care about. Does that make Does that make sense, George? Yeah, yeah. You know, I just I think it's an issue to be brought up because it's still out there. You know. Well, and that's one that we could hash over for hours on end. You know, just right, different right. trains of thought on that one. I mean, you go take that all the way back to the VHS Betamax wars. <laughs> well, and, and another question is is how do they? How does see technically the AACSLA are the are the governing body of the whole the whole shebang? How do they police this? Mm-hmm. And I guess that's really where it, that's the, where, where the question kind of devolves into. How are they right. going to police this? According to their, their guidelines, they're going to blacklist you. 
you know, and there's a number of of, of manufacturers. Um, there was one that that released one based on the uh, HDMI 1.4 this this year that allowed that was actively managing keys. Well, this is a, a group that had been a part of this whole group since 2004. So I don't I don't believe that they're doing anything illegal. Um, and so I guess some of it is is doing some research and seeing where these guys are coming from. Um, if right now 1.4 is not released to the public, the the specification. So if in that specification it says, hey, you know, you guys can actively manage, well, then, yeah, they're, then they're, their boxes are perfectly, quote, unquote, legal or within the, the guidelines of the specification. I just don't see somebody who's been involved with this whole thing for, you know, the last seven or eight years kind of chucking it and saying, you know what, forget you guys, we're going we're gonna to circumvent you. Yeah, sure. I mean, to make a metaphor out of it, it's sort of like the copyright on, on product names. So, you know, we say, you know, you're going to Xerox something or you're going to mm-hmm. do something that's, I'm going to Google it. It could come down to the point where people just say, well, the ubiquity on the market, it, market is these boxes that don't, don't even pay attention to it <laughs> yeah. or subvert it are mm-hmm. the mass market. And therefore, you've now overwhelmed it and it has become and you know standard what? because. You're right. That may be what it comes down to. And if it does come down to that. Um, <laughs> I feel sorry. It's a question I of feel, enforcement, you know. Yeah, I feel sorry that. for the companies that have spent millions of dollars doing it the right way. <laughs> well, precisely my statement yeah. and question really at hand is where do, where's the enforcement coming from and how do we know that it's okay? I mean, just the HDMI sticker on the front doesn't mean that they followed the rules. No, no, it, it should doesn't. mean it. <laughs> it should. And again, the only the only enforcement is is the blacklist. It really is. Right. Um, so. Right. Okay, um, back in the 80s and the 90s, I remember fondly going to, you know, clubs with, that had these giant video walls, and they were showing, you know, MTV and uh, other music videos and stuff like that. This year, it seemed like, not only in Infocom, but also in other places, um, with the, the, the shrinking size of the bezels around flat panels, and other things like Christie Micro Tiles, uh, which are kind of one foot by one foot, roughly, they're in, they're in metrics, um, Squares, the, the kind of the video wall has come back, sort of. I mean, has it, Linda? Uh, did it ever go away? Well, it did a little, didn't it? <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's. I, it, that's sort of strong to say. You know, it, it's it's back as if it's something that died and then you know um, is now being re- resurrected. But I think you you touched on one of the reasons is you know the technology portion. Um, the technologies display technology is getting better uh you need less room to put in a video wall than you did because probably when you were the video walls you're referring to uh probably took up what six or ten times the the amount of floor space that you need today and they were crts and they created all kinds of heat and (laughs) yeah i was about to say could heat a small house with those (laughs) exactly but then you also see i think it's also you know um well, on the other side of that is that people are, are finally learning how to use them in, in more ways than one. So George said something about the iPad effect. So, you know, we're we're finally understanding when you have a giant screen like that, what you can do with it. Um, and we are used to seeing them in places and want to see them in more places. So I think it's it's the intersection of those three things that are um, that that make the video all uh, more popular now. George, you're, you're a staging guy. Is this something, yeah. I mean, because uh, a few years ago, uh, Michael and I actually went to a, a different U2 show, and it was the year of the LED curtain. Mm-hmm. So okay. is, is the video wall kind of coming back in, in, in your realm? Well, I have to say that I agree with Linda. I don't think it ever really went away in the sense that, you know, it was sort of this fallow technology that, that, that we suddenly regrew in, in another field. Um, it was always been around, but the things like the Christie tiles have sort of made it available to the smaller venue, as it were. I mean, back in the mm-hmm. days, like you said, in the 90s, when we were all wearing uh, you know, under eye mascara and going goth at these clubs, <laughs> we, these, were, these were huge monstrosities. I mean, they were about the size of a, a small car, and you know, when you danced under them, you were like, God, I hope that never falls. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, interestingly enough, the company I work for, uh, Sharp Weisberg slash World Stage, uh, we just did a forum about content for large displays. And a lot of this is also being driven by the designers finally seeing that they can do these really cool things. Mm-hmm. That it doesn't have to just be an image mapping on a building, sort of like the Christie booth at Infocom had that huge slot machine. Mm-hmm. 
but you can do similar things with those tiles and with um, and with sort of these now very thin bezeled or you know the mullions are very close uh, uh, video walls where you can do these real projects and people as we just as, as Linda just pointed out are starting to see well we can really do something interactive with this we can actually attract their attention and give good information not just train schedules and buy this product <laughs> you can actually get them involved and again that's the, that's the other situation where it just it comes in and compact enough that you know. 16 tiles, maybe not take may, the, the crystal tiles may not take up much space, but it's going to get your attention, and you can do some really, really dynamic stuff with it. Oh yeah, you're yes. right. Go and they're a damn sight cheaper than uh, than a, a, an LCD panel <laughs> over the long term. Yes, over the long term, and, and you're right. They they are more than just train schedules. They are interactive now, which is which is yeah. kind of what's, in my opinion, driving some of this now because you have the iPad world or the world that the iPad is creating, and so. I think that there's there's going to be an expectation uh, of the mass uh, of people, just people in general, the uh, the society at large, is going to expect almost here pretty soon that when they walk up to any kind of display, that it's going to be interactive. And if it's not, it's going to be a letdown. Right. Sort of like um, TV ads these days. We expect it to get our attention, entertain us, not just give us information, or we ignore it. Yeah. So in the same way, for these walls, the content is going to drive whether it's a success or not. I, you know, I think you just hit the nail on the head there, George. It's about the content and the and the interactivity of these elements. You know, the video wall never went away. We've always used them in command and control centers and digital signage applications for asynchronous presentation. But it, it's really becoming a synchronous media now with the, the introduction of interactive content and the capability of the displays to interact with the, with the viewer. Very cool. Great. All right, uh, next story. Uh, a few weeks ago in Infocom's uh, e-newsletter, they had an article that I found very fascinating. It was the top or the best AV iPad apps, or the best AV apps in general. I shouldn't, I shouldn't limit it to the iPad because you also have the iPhone. They also listed on there any kind of BlackBerry or Android, um, any, any Android uh, applications. Um, for me personally, the, the coolest and probably the least useful for me, at least in my line of work, is the SPL meter just because I think it's cool to open up your phone and show your wife exactly how loud she's talking, um, <laughs> or, or, or or should say my kids? How how about that? Um, my kids, how loud they're actually go. talking? Yes, pick on the little ones. Let's pick they on the little ones. No, <laughs> <laughs> but but that and actually uh, the there's a projector calculator one which I just personally find find really cool. Um, George, what is your, your your top couple? First of all, do you do you have a smartphone, and do you I use have a any? Droid. Of these? Okay, there you go. I'm a, I'm a big Droid fan. Droid Inspire. Um, I I love these. I, I you as well. I have the SPL meter because I just love that, and I use it for my four and six year old sometimes. Going, see, too loud. <laughs> um, uh, on a side note, my second favorite app of all time on my Droid though is the Flashlight app. That is cool. Works like a charm. I can't if I can't find my. Uh, my little flashlight, this thing works great. Um, I am a big fan of those uh, conversion cal- calculators or the calculators, like the projection mm-hmm. calculator that's available. Um, you know, any kind of those, you know, conversion stuff. There's, I think, even one for um, put in the color codes for a resistor and it tells you its value. Oh, wow. It's geeky, I know, but I love that. Um, the one thing I noticed that wasn't there that I've always, always wanted was a time code reader and or generator. It, it could be straight oh, wow. LTC. I don't need Vitsi. I don't need, you know, just 29997. I'm fine with that. But no one seemed to have produced a mobile, you know, they've got these fancy, fancy, you know, real-time analyzers, but I want time code. So, George... And it's the world we live in to chase stuff, but just being old, you know, I used, you know, the old Studer open decks with the Lynx timelines. I want time code. George, explain, explain to someone who would be me, uh, who doesn't exactly understand what, what how, how would that be used? In, uh, in well, your world or in anybody's a, world? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a numeric um, sequencing counting scheme that allows machines to lock to each other based on a frame rate. So you have hours, minutes, seconds, frames that are continually streamed out, and you can lock two machines or a video together so that you don't get uh, a problem with lip sync. Uh, the best example is that when you're recording a music video, they're playing the music while the person's lip syncing to it. Both the machine and the video have the same time code so that when you get back to post edit, if you need to replace the audio for some reason or vice versa, you can match them up absolutely identical so there's no, no slippage. So uh, we've all seen those videos that, you know, where someone's talking and it almost looks like it's a translated uh, kung fu movie. Yes. So are you looking for an app that 
uh, reads time code wirelessly or that's a uh, time code source to sync to? Um, I'd love to do both, but mostly to put one out. Okay. So to be able to go out of the little thing and, yeah, you know, and if you've been on site where the, you need to sync stuff, sometimes it's just good to have and go, okay, let's do this. Right. It's also a good way to keep an accurate track of what you're doing as you're creating a video content. Because mm-hmm. once it gets to post, you'll need something to reference it to. Right, right. And it's just, you cool. know, I know it's esoteric, it's out there, but I'd love to just be able to do it. Well, that's legitimate, though. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and my big no on these apps, uh, the one I see a lot of is the video editing on your iPhone. The iPad I get, but why is it available for an iTouch iPhone? I just, I, maybe it's, I'm not a video guy, but I can't conceive of editing my home videos on an iTouch. <laughs> At least not that small It just doesn't space. make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. All right, Linda, what is, uh, well, first of all, do you, do you have some sort of, of smart device? Do I have both an iPhone and an iPad? Ooh. Uh, I don't have a Mac, though. Don't judge me. I have a PC. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, and I, I wanted to say, I think the unifying factor, I also love my SPL meter. Oh, um, yes. Although we don't have kids, I, uh, I am married to a sound guy, so it's always very important to be able to know <laughs> what DB is going on around you so yes. that so that that i think is is um i don't know if that's a favorite it's almost like a necessity uh for me my absolute favorite and speaking of the mac and pc crossover is the splash top remote desktop it is an app uh that's 4.99 so it is not free uh but it gives me access to my pc laptop through my i device and i mm-hmm. can bypass any knowledge you need to know about setting up a vpn or anything else like that. So it sort of really opens up an entire uh, world on your iDevice only because you don't necessarily need to have an app for that because I can reach through my iDevice and access my desktop and, and do whatever I need to do um, if that's if, if I need to. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Michael, you have an iPad. You don't have a, anything else, but what, what is your one or two favorite uh, apps? Oh, you know, I think the SPL meter is just the way to go. <laughs> You're just weird. <laughs> no, the uh, obviously the the audio tools are always fun. Um, I've got the SPL meter and the real time analyzer uh, RTA light, which comes in very beneficial uh, for that quick just spot check of what's going on in a room or space. But in addition to that, um, Autodesk this year launched their online version of AutoCAD, which is AutoCAD WS. And it allows us to take uh, full-blown CAD drawings, get them on the go, do markups and whatnot with the customer or on-site, um, put some additional detail, make some notes right on the drawings, be able to ship that out to uh, your CAD guys to finalize or to your engineers to verify. So I found that to be a great productivity increase. And that one's not free, I'm assuming, because it's Autodesk. Actually, it is free. Really? That's the beauty of it. Wow. So you upload basically you upload your DWG files to their website, and then you have access to them remotely, as long to as you've Autodesk. got a Wi-Fi or a 3G connection. To Autodesk's website. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, something else that I think is kind of neat, and it's it kind of, uh, at least for, for end users, it gives them another level of control, and that is in conjunction with uh, a number of digital consoles. Uh, sound, um, uh, well, uh, uh, Alan and Heath has a, 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 an iPad app that you can, basically you can control the services with an iPad app. And so then you could be anywhere in your space, including on stage, which gives you kind of like uh, monitor control right at the site. So if you're the performer, then you can adjust your monitors, adjust any kind of feed. And whether you have a personal monitor- monitoring system or you have open wedges, it, it gives you uh, you know a five hundred dollar or however much the app cost monitor control um, for you know live staging and in, 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 in whether it's a church market or the theater market or what have you. So I, that that is another one that I think is kind of cool is uh, is the ability to control your soundboard. Well, you know, it's interesting you brought that one up because we um, put a deployment in over the summer for a large Baptist church here in St. Louis, and they did just that. They got an iLive 112, T112. Um, it's a 48-channel input system. So with the iPad app, they, they gave each musician an iPad. had this quick, cool little quick lock stand that it went on and uh, um, basically told them, hey, this is your bus. You create your mix, and away went the Avioms, away went the submixers, and they're doing everything straight from the, hmm. the mix rack. That's kind of cool. So it's, it's really ingenious. Um, from Sound and Communications, the audio manufacturers create the OCA Alliance. 
Um, basically, from the story, it's it's eight professional audio manufacturers have formed a group whose mission is to secure the standardization of the open control architecture. Uh, it's a media networking system. The, the guys that are, are in this are Bosch, uh, DNB, Duran Audio, Loud Technologies, Media Technology Systems, Personas, uh, Salzbrenner Strategic Media Group and TC Group, and, and what they're doing, guys, is they're they're kind of an op- it's almost like an open architecture or open source control system for audio. And there's two things for this. There's first of all, I think it's really cool, and, and I think it's important that these guys have gotten together. But the second, the, the where this leads me to, is why haven't other like manufacturers? gotten together like why haven't you know a bunch of video guys gotten together and said hey let's let's standardize our control and um you know give people you know the ability to whether you're using you know uh, a bosch piece of equipment or a loud piece of equipment to you know move that into the video realm mr george yeah you know i've only seen two universal or standardized control protocols ever succeed um you know the old joke is somebody sits there going there's too many protocols there's 14 of them out there why we know we should make an open standard and and make it just one the result 15 protocols um you know the only two that i've ever seen work are dmx and midi um and because they really had a tight organization and they provided for people to have their own set of commands within the standardized commands which were required So if the device could do it, you were required to be able to accept that command. I mean, look at HDMI. What is it? uh, CCS, I think it's called? CEC. CEC, sorry. Mm -hmm. CEC. Everybody agreed about it. They made all this noise about it. And, you know, the automation manufacturers better get their act together because now they're going to be usurped. And nobody's using it. Or if they're using it, they're using it wrong. Or they're doing Mm -hmm. silly things. Earlier you said about, you know, the standard setup is a Blu-ray player and a a, a monitor. Mm -hmm. There is cases where we, I've read about where you have two Blu-rays in a system. You turn Blu-ray 1 on, Blu-ray 2 is already on, it turns off. <laughs> you know, in a multi-distributed system, that doesn't work. Yeah. So the, the, I'm always suspicious of these things, having gone through on the staging side, the, what is it, the Lone Wolf, which did it for RF and audio. Crown, I think, still has theirs, but it was supposed to be that universal, every amplifier will have it, you just need one controller to, to control your amplifier. You know, open standards are hard things to to really get the the industry to accept. Linda, is that something you've you've had any experience with with open standards and, and other manufacturers? Well, I not necessarily open standards per se. Um, I should say that I uh, my first job in AV was at EAW, which is a loud company. Hmm. Uh, my husband worked there for about ten years and and still works for a loudspeaker manufacturer, although not anyone in the OCA. Um, it's funny though. I'm, I was smiling as George was was talking about some of you know his experience of, of hearing about standards or, or things like the OCA. You can say rant. Come- I ranted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I was smiling, so that's okay. Um, and and it's funny though because I've seen the other side of that because I know uh, uh, my husband does product development. So so from the behind the scenes, uh, I, I know about protocols and standards that have tried to be that that maybe people no one has ever heard of because they never saw the light of day um and i think we all agree that it's a good idea you know in theory who doesn't like an open standard i mean who whether it's av or audio or anything else uh but my view about oca is that this is traditionally a um a segment of the market that doesn't necessarily talk to each other so between oca uh, ABB Alliance, uh, PAMA, which is the Pro Audio Manufacturers Alliance. I, I don't, it, nothing may ever come of them. Some great things may come of them, but it's the fact that this segment is finally talking to each other. And that I don't see how that can be a bad thing necessarily because um, I think that that type of collaboration has been sorely lacking for a long time. Let me throw something out there that is incredibly crazy and I will probably get yelled at by a number of, of people that, that I know. What would happen, or what are the what's the likelihood of control manufacturers coming together in something like this? A rift, <laughs> time space continuum would open and swallow us all. <laughs> and, and I ask that again as as a simple minded end user, um, because you have a number of them who 
there is one group that will allow you as an end user to connect to your to your system and take off the the compiled code and do with it what you will. There are others that the only person that can do that is is the person who who programmed it originally. There are HTML, there is, you know, C++, there is Cold Fusion, there's all this other different types and, and ways to control your system. Um, why, would it be, why would it be so evil for all of the Trons and the Xs and the Auroras to get together and say, hey, you know, here's a basic protocol of, of how we control the world? George? It would be, it would be nice. It would be nice. <laughs> Um, one, I don't know how manufacturers would then distinguish themselves. I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's, in the recent years, there's been a huge growth in those companies that is vertical and horizontal product lines, so that they're doing more than just control. Uh, that's sort of an ancillary thing for them now. It's like, you know, you got a protocol, yeah, we can do it. Um, you also don't want to stifle innovation here. Um, you know, setting up a standardization is a good thing, and if it's open source, sort of like the Firefox stuff is, or any other, numerous other, you know, uh, uh, favorites these days, you do help uh, grow innovation in that product and in new ideas. Uh, where did HTML5 come from, right? Yeah. Um, it, so it, it's, standardization is good, and people agreeing is good, but it, look, we're still fighting over pin 2, pin 3 hot, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. You know, we're, yeah. we're still fighting over it. It was set up before AES24 was even thought of, and it's still, you know... You know, when I go on any show, we have an entire case full of turnarounds. You know, it's like it, you still have to figure that stuff out. And it would be nice if they could all agree like DMX or like MIDI did. MIDI, or DMX not so much, but MIDI was a great example. They really fought over it. They said, okay, okay, here's what we're going to do. And you should be able to do these set things. And if there's anything you want specific to your product, there's this little set of, you know, two four-bit words that was your called sysx commands. And you can do whatever you want. And if 90% of what your gear does is that, that's great too. And then they also allowed for other versions. There's what MIDI timecode, which rides within and mm -hmm. on its own, and MIDI show control, which is a whole different set of protocols, but based on the same architecture. And I guess that's, that's a success. But see, that's where I was coming from. It, it, are these manufacturers other to second and third and fourth product lines? Because you're right. Yeah, we can control it, but we can also, you know, do HD over Cat Five, and we can do this, and we can do that. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the IT industry. You know, AV has become so much more IT centric, both in the video and on the audio side. And one of the things that the IT world does very well is establishing standards. They establish standards of communication, standards of protocol, standards of control. But then they allow that flexibility, just like you said, George, in the, in the DMX world, your device does XYZ. But um, it does X, Y, Z this way, and this is the standard mm -hmm. way of doing it. If you want to do A, B, and C, you can do that, but here's the structure for which to work. And, oh, by the way, if you find a new innovative way to do this, bring it back to the committee. Let's look at it. Let's all learn from it. Um, so right. I use the OSI model as a standard, you know, in the, in the networking world where you've got the seven layers, and that's the foundation. But then you can build on that. And one of my biggest pet peeves is the fact that we have not learned as the AV industry to become um, interoperable, I should say, with other industries such as IT. And the SNMP protocol is a, is a very um, specific case that I'm referencing where, um, you know, a router, a switch, a PC can all talk simple network management protocol. But if I put a projector on a network, it doesn't know what to do with an SNMP packet because we haven't standardized our ways of communication. It's very Thank apt. You. Very apt. Uh, next story. This is from our fine folks at Infocom, who I love to death. Kramer Electronics has entered into an agreement with Infocom International to offer Infocom licensed courses throughout the world. Up until now, it was just um, Kramer had an, an agreement with Infocom for just the U.S., but now this agreement expands the original agreement to include all markets in all countries around the world. Here's here's where I'm going with, with, with this question, and, and it, I think it's really cool that Kramer has done this. Um, my question is, why hasn't anybody else? Um, I personally have gone to, you know, three or four manufacturers training. Michael has, George, and Lynn, I'm sure you guys have. George, why, why wouldn't anybody else kind of enter into this type of agreement? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm not quite sure why they wouldn't want to. Um, there is, in certain industries, like the staging industry I am in now, um, I did spend a lot of time in the integration world. 
um, where they say, you know, it's hands-on. It's the apprenticeship method. And, but, you know, it's too complicated these days to be just apprentice. You can't just be a pl even a plumber these days. You can't just learn from the guy next to you about how to do this stuff. A lot of it's very complicated. Um, well, I worked for a, a large manufacturer for a number of years as a, as a head of tech support, and we insisted that every new hire become CTS within the six-month window for the new one, and within two weeks, when it was the old, just do it online. Yeah. If they didn't do it, they were told to very much thank you and have a good day. Um, so I, I see the value in it. I'm CTS, and I've kept it up because I think it was a great thing. Um, as much as I thought I knew, I still had to really concentrate on some parts of it and really understand the learning and remember you know, my Ohm's Law tables and <laughs> how to calculate all that. Um, why more manufacturers don't do it, I'm not sure. Maybe there's a fear of pressuring people. I mean, I know when, when I took the classes, I took it with a bunch of guys in a classroom, and a lot of them were a little bit older than me at that point. I'm probably as old as they were then. Um, and they were very nervous about taking the test. So nervous. All those years of doing it, and maybe I'm doing it wrong, but it works. But I don't want to be tested on it. Yeah. Um, Again, I really believe in the whole CTS thing because the people I've met who know that stuff and when I've interviewed people for, that have CTS and we used to put them through the ringer when we interviewed them, uh, those people usually were able to, if not tell me what the answer is, logic the answer out. And that's what's really important in the, in the end. Yeah, and, and my, my other thing about this is, you know, the, the manufacturer, after I got my CTS, obviously I have my RUs, my renewal units. And mm -hmm. I can get those through manufacturers, and so I, 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 so they're already kind of doing it, and they're already kind of partnering with, with Infocom, because whether it's you know a speaker manufacturer or a control system manufacturer or a, a video switcher manufacturer, if I go to their training, I get a certain number of units, and what do I have? Two or three years to to, to get those, right? And so they're already kind of partnering with them. I guess you know I don't know you know why. You know, and again, I'm just a simplistic, you know, end user. So, well, for 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 Kramer, it's a really good marketing opportunity. It's a great outreach. I mean, all of us are live on social, where we know outreach and the conversation is the single most important part of it. Uh, the content that we create to create a discussion around is is very important, but the actual conversation is where where we really find value. And this is something that Kramer has a really good advantage with. I think is that they're going to go worldwide, be able to teach these people. They're going to become not just a thought leader, but the in the entity that is recognized with higher education and AV. Yeah, the the training, they, you know. Yeah. If nobody else jumps on and they become the exclusive by default, that's a great <laughs> thing to be. That's that, a, it's suicide is what it is, you know, by the other manufacturers. Right, um, I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know as well as I do, we've all been to those manufacturer trainings, and, and they've got tremendous educational institutes. I mean, I can name three yeah. manufacturers right now that just have first-class training rooms oh, and yeah. instructors and um, – there's no reason they shouldn't all be capitalizing on this opportunity. So let's all yeah, call so info. I, <laughs> Go ahead. I was just saying, I, I was mystified as well why they wouldn't want to uh, to join in. You know, they, they, I don't see a downside to it other than resource time, but that should be minimal. Now, can, let's look at this from the converse on, on the op opposite side of the of the coin here. Does this um, set the stage for someone like a Kramer to? Um, have a, a preferred relationship with Infocom? Does it does it show them preference? Does it show them favor with the organization uh, in light of the other manufacturers not participating? In what way? Well, is it open to the other manufacturers? First of all, I didn't I didn't see that in the article because this isn't it's, it's a licensing agreement to conduct that training, right? So, is it open? Do we know that? that it's even available to everyone else? Or is this, like you said, George, is it exclusive or is it going to be exclusive by default when nobody else signs on? Hmm. That's, that's not right. a bad idea to, you know, to ask Infocom and Kramer that question. So Yeah. yeah it, it's worth, a, worth an email and a phone call. Well, guys, I appreciate your time. Um, I think the first episode here has gone rather well. Uh, Linda said Frimby's. Let me try that again, Linda. <laughs> Linda said, go ahead. Linda Sid Frembus. Linda Sid Frembus has been with that's us. Why, see that? That's why I go by, by AV writer because no one else. <laughs> <can count. laughs> that's that's a good one. Um, she is she is the AV writer. Uh, her her website is avwriter.com. 
Uh, Frembus. Website, by the way. Frembus. dot com. Frembus. Yeah, don't go to avwriter. dot com. That's 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 a part I'll I'll cut out. Frembus. dot com. F r e m b e s. dot com. She is also AV Writer on Twitter. And something that that Linda has kind of started um, is the AV Chat. Uh, it it happens from time to time. I believe every couple weeks on Twitter. And Linda, why don't you explain to people kind of how, if they're interested, if they've, if they've never heard of the AV chat, how it works and how they get involved in it? Um, sure. Well, it is, as you said, it is a Twitter chat. It happens twice a month. Uh, we talk about various topics that um, I have listed on my website. Um, I'm usually either myself or my co-moderator, Paul Konikowski. Uh, we sort of lead the group in a Twitter discussion about things about AV. So most recently we talked about women in AV, which is a big topic lately. Uh, uh, our next chat is August 4th. I was going to say next week, but then I realized that people will be listening to this podcast at all different times. So our uh, next chat is August 4th at three o'clock Eastern time. And the topic is uh, CTS and continuing, edu- I can't even talk, continuing <laughs> education uh, in AV. And so if anyone wants to get involved, there's details of how to participate online on my site. On your site. And there's also, isn't that where also the list of the the topics are, is is frembees.com. And you can also look at transcripts in case uh, people want to know what they're in for. There's a list of transcripts as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Linda, for for coming. Uh, Thank you. George Tucker is Tucker Twos uh, on on Twitter. He is a uh, live staging engineer. He's also a tech blogger. George, anything that you want to plug or promote? Uh, no, if you're interested in my rants, uh, you can find me uh, just by searching Tucker Twos. Uh, it's tuckertoos.typepad.com or on Tucker Tertiary on Tumblr. Uh, and I'm always uh, open to uh, to fight the fight with anyone who wants to do it. <laughs> uh, Michael Drainer is actually that. Michael Drainer, D-R-A-I-N-E-R on uh, Twitter. Uh, he is a, a local um, uh, integrator here in St. Louis, so thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. And I am Tim Albright. That would be T as in Tim, D as in David Albright, A-L-B-R-I-G-H-T on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+, Plus, and all that other jazz. Thank you guys very much. This has been AV Week, episode 0000. And uh, we'll see how this one goes, and uh, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.